think he might be muted. Yeah, sorry, I was um, just starting the record function. It, it uh, locked me out, but hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here this evening and joining us. Um, and hopefully you get a lot out of it. Great, and just a, a quick word before we jump into fencing uh, to introduce FACT. Um, Food Animal Concerns Trust, or FACT, is a nonprofit organization that promotes humane farming and advocates for the safe production of meat, milk, and eggs. And uh, FACT helps consumers make humane and healthy choices. Our Fund the Farmer project, which is one of FACT's projects, awards grants to humane farmers and also facilitates peer-to-peer -peer farmer education in order to increase the number of animals that are raised humanely. This webinar today is one of a series of quarterly webinars we're hosting all this year. Um, covering various topics in humane farming methods. Um, and we encourage everyone uh, on the line today to consider joining our email list or our humane farming forum uh, to keep up to date on all the upcoming webinars and other learning opportunities, such as scholarships to conferences. Um, and there will be a way for you to uh, indicate that you want to sign up when you take the survey after um, the webinar. So just a, a heads up about that. There, there will be more opportunities um, to learn coming up. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Larissa to introduce Randy. Well, thanks, Lisa. Yeah, I get the honor of introducing our speaker tonight, Randy Cutler. <clears throat> Randy and his wife, Sally, have a 227-acre farm um, up in central Wisconsin where they raise sheep, beef, cattle, poultry, and vegetables. Randy established a uh, cutler fence over 10 years ago to work directly with farmers and to promote rotational grazing. He's taught high school agriculture and also traveled to several foreign countries to teach farmers. Um, I first saw Randy present at the Moses Organic Farming Conference earlier this year and thought that his workshop, that basically he'll be presenting tonight on fencing would be uh, particularly relevant to folks who are committed to rotational grazing and raising their animals in uh, a pasture-based systems. So we're really lucky to have him here online tonight to share his knowledge and his expertise. He'll present for approximately an hour and then we'll open the floor to your typed questions as uh, Lisa indicated earlier. So without further ado, here is Randy. Oh, can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Yes. Can Everyone else is muted, Randy. <laughs> but yes, we can hear you. Okay. I'm going to mute myself. But yeah, you're coming through loud and clear. All right. A little bit about my farm here. I grew up on this farm. Um, born and raised here. It was my parents' farm. Uh, I went to college and then uh, came back in 1976. Uh, these are my grandchildren here with some of my uh, the sheep that they show at the fair. I inherited some bad fences here, and so I did my best with what I had. And uh, in 1986, I was introduced to Gallagher, uh, um, the Gallagher Company in electric fencing. I started rotational grazing sheep uh, at that time. Opened a fence shop, shop, and I started fencing um, professionally in about 1990. I found out that I could uh, sell a lot more fence if uh, if I could install it. So I want to talk about planning and placement and practicality of fencing. Um, if you have questions uh, in regard to any particular questions you you want answered, you might want to post them, um, and I'll try to cover them. But um, uh, I won't talk a lot about uh, predator uh, or um, about fences uh, that we need to keep animals out. It's mostly about containing containing animals. Uh, if you have uh, questions about about um, uh, preventing deer or something from getting in your fence, uh, we could add, we could get, get to that at a later time. So most fences, uh, most of the um, is in planning and a uh, fence company like me, uh, we can do the rest of the work. Uh, there's a picture of my ewe lambs. So uh, I got blue-faced Lester and uh, Shetland Cross sheep. Uh, so those are what you call mules in the front. So in regard to planning, 
first of all, we have to consider what species you're going to fence. So it makes a lot of difference whether you have sheep, beef, goats, dairy, or uh, or pigs or whatever. <clears throat> dairy cattle uh, and dairy goats are a lot different uh, fencing strategies than sheep or goats are. So first, the thing we need to consider is your species. And then we need to consider what are the uses of your fences. Uh, are we going to make this as, as a dry lot? Are we going to make a permanent uh, situation here? Are we renting some land? Uh, are we rotational grazing? And like I said earlier, do we have dairy cattle? Do we need to get them back to the barn twice a day? Uh, do we have heifers that need to be bred? Uh, we need to bring them in for AI. Uh, so uh, do we need a lane? Or not? We need to keep things keep things in, or do we need to keep things out? So, what type of fence do you need? <clears throat> There's a lot of different types of fences, a lot of different options, depending on your budget, depending on your concerns. Um, do you need barbed wire? Do you need woven wire? Do you want high tensile electric fence? Do you like tape or rope? Um, is chain link something that you can use? Uh, wooden fences or hedges? Um, the land is important, uh, makes a lot of difference in the cost of a fence or in the type of fence we, we use, uh, the soils, uh, the different types of soils. Of course, if there's uh, uh, rock layers near the top, that's a uh, concern as far as getting posts in the ground. The, the topography makes a lot of difference in the cost of the fence. If we have a lot of hills, dips, and curves, uh, that uh, makes for a lot more bracing, a lot more wooden posts. Uh, um, it's a little more difficult, a little more expensive. We need to consider uh, the le legality of fences. Uh, every town, not every, but a lot of townships, even villages, cities, um, counties, states, all have different uh, rules and regulations and regarding fences. Uh, you may need to consider them when you build a fence uh, so that you have a legal fence. Uh, I've been involved in a couple of lawsuits uh, as an expert witness uh, where an uh, animal had gotten out and uh, someone had ki killed the animal uh, with a vehicle or had damaged the vehicle and there were lawsuits involved. So uh, consider what your municipality's regulations are. Also, uh, we need to look at this as far as uh, what the, how we need to, uh, what effect the fencing is going to have on our nutrient management. First of all, when we talk about placement of fences, the best thing to do is to get an aerial photo. That's fairly easy to get. <clears throat> um, Google Earth or uh, you can go to some places that could, can print you a uh, aerial photograph. This particular photograph is uh, of a fence job that that or two different fence jobs that we had did estimates on or or did. Um, we need to know where the what the dimensions are in order to determine the cost of the fence, and we need to know the location of all the gates. That's critical as far as uh, uh, setting up a fence design and uh, and uh, the cost. So gate. Placement is important because we need to know what types of gates, the size of the gates, the need of the gate, or what you're going to use it for. Um, we place a gate to move cattle or animals in a corner. Um, we place a gate for people to get in where it's most convenient. We place a gate if you need to put get machinery in or out of the of your fence uh, at a different location. So consider where you want your gates and what you want your gates for and uh, that's important when you uh, ask for a design or you ask for an estimate or cost uh, or considering the cost of the, of, uh, of the fence. Every time you start and stop a fence you'd have to put in a corner assembly and that'll add anywhere from fifty to two hundred dollars and uh, gates are important depending on what type are different depending on what type of animals you're going to use and again if you're going to move animals you need to put your gates on a corner or else have an army to help you move them 
um, what's the practicality of fences? There's basically what I say there's two different types of fence, or actually three. Uh, there's your mental barrier, and there's a physical barrier. As a physical barrier, we're talking to an actual physical barrier. That's something that uh, when animals contact it, it it's going to stop them from going through. So uh, hedges, um, woven wire, barbed wire, uh, wood boards, etc. Those are physical barriers. A mental barrier is the animal is controlled by its by pain, um, by respect, and uh, so electric fences are are mental barriers. A lot of times, what I see uh, uh, people talk about their fence, or they say they need a fence, or something wrong with their fence, and that's because they have what I call an on-your-honor fence, uh, where there really isn't any electricity on the fence or the fence is falling down. Or another thing you could have is a good dog. Keep your animals in. So um, the cost of fence, practicality of the cost of fence, an example of the cost there, I got that posted $1.60. Um, we did some quotes for a four-wire uh, barb fence barbed wire fence at about a dollar sixty a foot. You can look at your resources, different resources there are in order to help you with designing a fence. Um, the NRCS, um, there's a link there for them. Um, there's other private uh, um, companies, fence companies, the University Extension, at least in Wisconsin and other states. And in Wisconsin, we have uh, some districts, uh, rural conservation districts. Uh, they also have grazing specialists that will help you to, with your design. Um, <clears throat> like I was saying before, the different types of physical fences are uh, uh, pipe, a board, uh, vinyl, woven, barb, hedge, welded wire, uh, all your different options. Of course, these are vary in, in their costs. Uh, but they also are important for certain certain uses as a lot of times where most people are going to need some type of physical barrier, whether you have electric fences or not. I always recommend a certain area of your farm to be allocated to a physical barrier so that you can then physically contain your animals in an emergency situation so that uh, if they're your electric fence has uh, broken down or something, you still have the backup or you have some type of physical barrier. Um, <clears throat> when we consider a physical barrier, or uh, we would consider the different types of posts. Uh, some people use uh, strictly a wooden post fence. Uh, the best products for wood are uh, cedar, locust, a lot of people in the south have uh, have um, hedge or Osage orange. Around here, we mostly use uh, cedar locust. We have a treatment plant where they treat uh, Norway pine, and uh, there's other types of, other types of pine trees that are treated with various treatments so that the post will last longer. When we use a corner post, we like to use a co post that is about five to six inches in diameter and eight feet long, we will drive those posts into the ground four feet here in this part of the country. We have frost so that we need to get down to the below the frost line in our corner so that the posts don't heave up. I do not recommend using the concrete in this in this part of the country so we don't pour concrete and a pounded post is always a lot sturdier than than uh, a dug post, a post that's been dug in with an auger or by hand, a post that's pounded or driven with the pointed end and down, a post that is dug in is uh, uh, put where you place the, the wide end or the, the larger end in and tamp it around. Something about steel T posts, you want to consider the weight of the post. Now, steel posts are rated by the pounds per foot. So there are uh, basically two different sizes or weights of posts. And uh, 
when you buy a steel T post, they are either 1.25 pounds per foot or 1.33 pounds per foot. And there's a considerable difference in cost between the 1.25 and the 1.33. Uh, the 1.33 pound posts are, are much heavier and uh, we're going to hold up uh, longer, especially in a clay soil. And the height of the fence is important, or the height of the post, the T-post is important, whether you have, uh, uh, depending on uh, the type of fence you have, uh, you want the post that it, it, that it has a T or a pad on the bottom, and that post needs to be driven in past the pad, or and that's where they, and past the flat plate, and um, that's how deep you need to drive that post in the ground. Um, usually, that's about 18 inches. <clears throat> so if you want a fence that's 48 inches high, you need to uh, have a post that's about five and a half feet to six feet long for a steel T post. Uh, the coating is important. Uh, there are different coatings on, on T posts, different paints, um, and there are T posts that you can find that are galvanized. When we're talking a physical barrier, one type of physical barrier is woven wire. And uh, when we do a woven wire, we do what's called an H brace. And an H brace on the corner is, starts with a, a five to six inch diameter post in the corner with a, um, another vertical post placed somewhere between six and 10 feet um, away from the corner post. And then a horizontal brace, horizontal post placed between the two and uh, that's what's called an H because it looks like an H. <clears throat> when we do a woven, woven wire, we stretch it. We stretch it with, with, with what's called a stretcher bar. And if you look in some of your fencing catalogs, you'll find a stretcher bar. And you place the bar under the wire, uh, hammer the wedges, wedges into the loops, and that holds the wire in place, and then stretch the wire with a come along or uh, with um, a tractor or, or uh, some solid uh, implement that you can stretch it to, and it needs to be stretched fairly tight. We generally use high tensile wire, whether it's woven, barbed, or, or smooth wire. We like to use what's called high tensile wire. Um, uh, high tensile wire generally is somewhere between 140 PSI to uh, 210 PSI or pounds per square fin, foot. Uh, soft wire, this is an example on this picture, is, is soft wire. And uh, that wire is soft, easier to bend, a little easier to work with. The problem with soft wire is once you stretch it, it, it really doesn't stay stretched. It's, it starts to sag, and you need to continually maintain that soft wire. While with high tensile, if you pull it tight, it stays tight. Uh, post spacing is important with woven wire. You need to place posts, depending on your regulations, somewhere between 12 and 16 feet apart. High tensile wire can, posts can be placed further apart than soft wire posts. A lot of regulations call for 12 or 16 and a, to 16 and a half feet, which is a rod apart. Um, we can place a post up to 30 feet apart, depending on terrain, if you use high tensile. The gauge of, of, um, of woven wire is important. Uh, it's the thickness or the diameter of the wire. Most wires that we use today are either 12 gauge or 14 gauge high tensile uh, or softer high tensile wire. Now the top and bottom wire could be a heavier gauge and some woven wire has a 10 gauge top and bottom with a, a 12 gauge, uh, other, the other wires are 12 gauge. Also the knot is important. And if you look at this picture, this is what's called a fixed knot. And um, the next picture shows you an example of a backyard sheep and goat fence. This is a 14 gauge, and this is an S knot. So as the, the verticals and the horizontals are hooked together, there's a different knot. Now, the concern about the knot 
is if you, depending on your species, so for example, if you have uh, goats with small horns or sheep, um, they'll fit their head through a, a an opening about six by six and then get their horns on one side and can't get them back out. So your options are, what, cut the head off the goat or cut the wire on the fence. So uh, what we like to have is uh, a hinge knot uh, versus a fixed knot or a S knot because a hinge knot then can be moved slightly and you'll be able to slide the head through. So the knot is is important. When we talk about woven wire, we talk about the numbers. So all wo there's a lot of different kinds of woven wire, and there's a series of numbers that describe them. The first number, for example, on a 939 six fence, the nine stands for the number of horizontal wires. The second number, 39, stands for the number of inches tall the fence is. The third number, six, which represents the the distance in inches between verticals. So a 939-6, the nine horizontal wires, uh, 39 inches high, and six inches between verticals. Um, so other physical barriers uh, we're going to talk about slightly here is barbed wire. Now, <laughs> Barbed wire can be used for cattle, for sheep, for goats, and uh, for people. Uh, it's not recommended for horses. The horses seem to get tangled up in uh, in barbed wire and uh, don't heal very fast. On a barbed wire fence, typically we will space, we will place four wires, five wires, or six wires. If you're interested in using a barbed wire fence for sheep or goats, you need eight wires. Um, so the and the wires are spaced fairly close together for sheep. For cattle, a four wire fence fence will work, and uh, it is generally placed at uh, 18, 28, 38, and 48 inches. A uh, five-wire fence, we would put the bottom wire at eight inches, and that can really keep uh, people out as well as, well as animals in for, for as far as uh, cattle go. Uh, the number of barbs or points, if you look at a, a barbed wire, there's a four-point barbed wire and a two-point barbed wire. Um, the four-point actually has Two uh, uh, or four points, or uh, and every barb has four points, while the two point has two. And the inches between the barbs is important. You like to have five inches between barbs or less. If you, your lower cost barbed wires have uh, six or seven or even eight inches between barbs. High tensile versus soft wire. We talked earlier about that. The same case with barbed wire versus uh, uh, high tensile versus soft wire as it is with uh, woven wire. So uh, I prefer high tensile wire. When you stretch that high tensile wire, it's hard to bend, but when you when you staple it on and you bend it around, uh, it stays where it's put. You don't need to, uh, you don't need to stretch the wire or continue uh, maintenance with it. Post spacing, uh, posts on a barbed wire fence need to be placed somewhere between 12 and 18 feet apart, depending on terrain. Um, and every time there's a vertical or horizontal directional change, you need to put in a solid wood post. Uh, you could put steel post in between. Uh, this is an example of a steel pipe welded brace. Uh, some people in Oklahoma did this uh, up in New York. And then they put uh, steel T posts in the line there. So uh, mental barriers. Um, I think most of us want to talk a little bit about or more about um, um, mental barriers rather than physical barriers. Uh, <clears throat> but um, we have a perimeter fence, an interior fence. Uh, do you want respect or you don't? Do you want revenge? I have um, people contact me regularly 
saying that I want to buy the largest electric fencer that you have. And I tell them, okay, I have one that's going to cost around $2,000 and will fence about uh, 700 acres. Um, Is that really what you want? Or do you just want revenge for the cows getting out and getting into your mother's uh, garden? So consider the that we want respect, not revenge. Uh, when we are using a mental barrier, uh, we, sh- we should not use steel teeth posts or any type of steel. Steel is the conductor, and the only conductors we want on our fence are the is the, the fence that does con- conduct, um, is the, the wire that conducts electricity. We don't want any other steel. Um, energizers, different types of energizers. We can talk a little bit about joules, amps, volts, testers. Um, we'll talk a little bit about testers a little later. Our remote controls. There are some fences that have remote controls and uh, some that don't. Uh, when you have a portable grazing system, you'll probably want to place the water out in the pasture because uh, you'll keep the animals in the pasture. Uh, are in that paddock for a period of time, and if they have access to water, you do a lot better job of, of spreading the manure and a lot better job of keeping the animals comfortable uh, in their paddock. And we'll talk about reels and other poly products. So on a mental barrier, the materials you want to look at is a portable poly products, electrified netting, um, protective coated wire for horses. We have um, a high tensile wire that's uh, coated with plastic, um, and that's a little safer uh, for horses. Uh, generally, a high tensile four wire electric fence runs about 80 cents a foot. These quotes that I've told you, as far as the numbers go, are for a square 40 acres and with one gate in them. That's approximate cost. Uh, the tensile strength is uh, important when we're talking about uh, high tensile smooth wire for electric fence. And uh, generally, uh, we use 170,000 PSI. Uh, that's a softer wire. We're able to bend it and wrap, wrap the insulators by hand. If you use uh, tensile strength of, say, for example, 200,000, you need to use what's called Nyquist sleeves and crimp the wire. There are some electrified woven wires. An example of one is a 44024. It's a four wire, 40 inches high, 24 inches between verticals. And uh, we're able to then electrify that wire, keep it about six inches off the ground. And it makes a very good uh, uh, mental barrier. And if the electricity isn't working, it also makes a a fairly good physical barrier for cattle and horses. Uh, when we use uh, high tensile electric fencing for uh, perimeter fences, I like to use what's called a floating brace corner assembly. Uh, since it's a phys- uh, since it's a mental barrier, we're not going to have any physical contact with that fence. Maybe once, um, and then after that, the animal shouldn't contact the fence again. So I like to use a floating brace, and here's a photograph of uh, me installing a floating floating brace. Uh, Basically, you just put a 10-foot post at an angle uh, attached to the corner post rather than having another uh, vertical post and a horizontal brace. This brace is at an angle, goes down to the ground with a pad underneath it, and uh, about one foot square, and then we uh, place uh, some... uh, a high tensile wire around the bottom of the po- upright post and around the bottom of the of the brace post, and we ratchet that tight. If you're interested, there's some YouTube videos on a floating brace. So um, when we talk about energizers, a lot of people ask me about uh, solar fence, <clears throat> solar fencers. Now, basically, a solar fencer is uh, a solar panel attached to an electric battery sensor. So 
there are a lot of what's called solar fencers around, and uh, there some of them are relatively inexpensive, but the solar panel is very small, and the amount of charge that that's able to put out is is quite small. We rate fencers by their what's called joules, and it's kind of a measurement of horsepower. And uh, this fence charger on the right is a Solar S17, and that has a 0.17 joules. So that's a fairly small fencer, and it will do about 10 acres. Uh, while the fencer in the middle, the fence charger in the middle, I don't know, that's either a B100 or a B200, and they're a one and a two joule fencer. If you want to try to keep sheep in, you're going to need more like six joules. Uh, so they are portable. Um, they Some come with a self-contained battery. Some are, you have to install your own battery or have, bring your own, your own battery. Um, they work real well until November and December, and batteries don't like cold weather either, but when the sun doesn't shine, um, they don't charge very well. So they are the most expensive for Juul, but if you're in a remote situation, uh, they might work very well for you, especially if you have a, a smaller area to deal with. So what's new in electric fence? We have uh, remote controls um, where you can turn a fence on and off. We had some situations where we installed the electric fence around uh, an area, a dairy farmer, and he had several houses uh, within his farm uh, along the road. And uh, earlier when they came out with remote controls, he was able to then touch the fence with his remote control and turn off the fence. And then he would walk down the fence and was checking his fence or moving something. And all of a sudden the fence would come on and the uh, remote control on the fence was not, not was sensitive enough where the, when the neighbor came home from, from work and used his remote control to open his garage door, it accidentally turned on the fence. Uh, nowadays, the remote controls are a little more sophisticated, but you do have to have a fair amount of charge on your fence for the remote control to actually work um, to shut the fence, turn the fence on and off. Uh, like I said, we have DC chargers and AC chargers, so chargers with batteries and chargers that plug into the fence. Um, and portable poly products. These are some examples of a couple of post pounders. We were talking earlier about uh, um, pounding a post. Uh, the post pounder on the right is a Bryce Suma, it was imported from Scotland, and uh, the inventor um, accompanied this post pounder over in New York, and uh, and there are some split black locusts posts on the back. We pounded uh, several uh, hundred of these uh, black locust posts with this post pounder. The post pounder on the left is um, is um, a king hitter. It has a tall mast and uh, it uh, is operated there with uh, skid steer. All these post pounders, there's a shaver is another brand and there's several other brands of post pounders. And if you would look in, like, for example, a Ken Cove catalog, they have several different uh, brands of fence post pounders there. I truly recommend a good post pounder and uh, to drive your post in the ground rather than digging the hole. Uh, the King Hitter is operated with the hydraulic levers. You raise the... the ram up and it comes down with about 40,000 pounds of pressure and hits that post. Um, you want to have a good sturdy post every time you pound it. <clears throat> this particular uh, machine was uh, made just strictly for build, building fence. Uh, no other purpose. So when we 
building an electric fence, what we want to do is we want to have, prepare a plan, first of all. We need to uh, decide uh, what we want the fence for and where we want it. We need to locate our gates. We need to consider uh, waterways and um, where it needs to go, uh, how we want to come up against the building. Uh, we need to then prepare a bill of materials so that uh, we can calculate what materials we need. So if we have the dimensions, uh, the design, we can prepare a bill of materials for the entire fence. We need to call, and in Wisconsin we call 811, Diggers Hotline. And uh, in different states there's different uh, uh, areas where you need to call. And um, that's essential that you contact uh, the company or private company or uh, or uh, public company that does the locates the utilities. Um, so many people just forget about that part of it, and we get there to install a fence, and uh, we re everyone realizes that there's a uh, high pressure gas line that goes through their property and um, the fence installer is responsible for uh, damaging uh, underground utilities so it is very important that we contact uh, someone to mark the underground utilities before we begin. We have to mark it and install the corners uh, first. Um, that's what we do because two points make a straight line uh, then we install the hill dip and curve posts with a post pounder, and then we pull the wire. If it's electric fence, we pull a, the high tensile wire, and we have our straight line. We stretch, stretch, and what I call slap the wire. We install the line posts, uh, make connections, and then uh, install the energizer. We need to then install the ground field, the lightning, and the lightning protector and then test the fence. Um, there's three portions of your fence. There's the fence charger, there's the fence itself, and then there's the grounding field. They're all three, they're all three very important. Uh, one is as important as the other, and if one portion doesn't work, the fence doesn't work. So if our fence charger isn't putting out the voltage. If there's something wrong with the fence charger, um, we need to check with that first. Uh, that's fairly easy to test. We need a digital voltmeter, and we're able to then test the fence on both the positive and the negative prongs and see that we have uh, um, proper voltage going out of the fence. And the next thing we do uh, is we can test the ground. and um, in order to test the ground, what we do is we go about 60 feet from the where the fence charger, um, where the electricity comes from the fence charger, and we start to ground out our fence. We stick a steel steel T post and a mud puddle and and bend it up against the high tensile wire, and then we test the the fence past the grounded out portion. It may take several. Uh, steel rods to ground that fence out, but we need to get down to about 300 volts. Once we have grounded out our fence to less than 300 volts, then we can go back to our ground and put the positive prong on the ground and then reach out as far as we can with the negative ground and stick that in the ground, and we should be measuring then again 300 volts or less. If we have more than 300 volts measured, what that means is that electricity is flowing on the wire, and uh, as it gets shorted, it goes back to the ground. It has to return to its source, <clears throat> and if it doesn't all return return to its source, it's going to some other ground field. And if you live in Wisconsin and you have uh, several dairy farms nearby, and they are uh, come and tell you that every time you turn your fence charger on, my cows won't drink. So we're creating what's called stray voltage. 
So we need to make sure that we are able to then collect all the electrons that are that are expelled by our fence charger and shorted through the fence back to our ground field. Now, a ground field is then uh, described by the footage of uh, um, the, the number of feet of ground rod in the ground. <clears throat> so the larger your fence charger, the more the more feet or the more length of ground rod you need in the, in the ground in order to catch the electricity, uh, electrons back to its source. So if we would install um, a six foot ground rod and we drive that in the ground six foot deep, we're creating then a ground field that is six foot down, a cylinder that's six foot in the ground, and six foot radius or 12 foot diameter. That cylinder is what's called our ground field. So that ground then around that ground rod is going to hopefully collect any electrons that are passed out to our, our fence charger. Now if we were to go 11 feet away from our first ground rod and stick in the ground another six foot ground rod and drive that down six foot, then we would have another ground field that's six foot deep and 12 foot in diameter and then we should go another 11 feet and place another ground rod that's the same so now we will have 33 feet by a by 12 foot ground field and uh, that should be adequate for a uh, four to six dual energizer and uh, should be able to collect all of our all of our electrons now what happens is as the as the pulse goes out of our fence charger every second, uh, thousands of volts go down, travel down the surface of a of a galvanized wire. Um, as they're traveling down the surface, our cow with a wet nose comes up and touches that that high tensile wire. The electrons then leap onto that wet nose, travel through the body of the cow down through her hoof that sticks in the mud, hopefully, and then travel through the soil that conducts the electricity all the way back to our ground field, and then through the wire on the ground back to our ground post on our fence charger. And not until then, until that electron reaches back the, to the negative post on our charger, will the animal get respect. So once that circuit is complete, the the light bulb goes on and the shock is felt. If the nose is not wet, if the ground is dry, uh, if there's a bad connection somewhere in between, um, then it's not going to work. So um, that ground field is is very important, <clears throat> uh, and it's different in every location some some places we may need we may need to put in a lot more ground rods than, than others sometimes we can't even get the ground rods in the ground and in that case we may do something like put a, a sheet of steel uh, bury it about a foot deep and um, uh, connect that our, our wire to that and uh, that'll make a ground field the other thing we, I want to say about a ground field is that you should use like metals. On a, for example, the fence, fence chargers that we sell, they have a galvanized post on the ground post that comes off from, from the fence charger, the, ne the negative post. Then we use a galvanized wire. We hook that with a galvanized clamp to a galvanized rod. If we were to use a aluminum wire and a copper rod, a brass, uh, a brass clamp, um, we would have unlike metals, and sometimes those uh, unlike metals cause corrosion, uh, and then we do not have a good connection. So uh, it's important that we use all like metals uh, on our ground field. As far as rotational grazing goes, the key to successful rotational grazing 
is to get respect from the poly. You need to get respect from the poly because that's the front line. Um, the, the poly wire is what's moved on a daily or three days or five days or twice a day um, of procedure. So we need to make sure that that poly wire is can, has 4,000 volt charge on it. <clears throat> if you can get uh, respect from the poly wire, you're able to have complete control of your herd or your flock. If the poly wire doesn't have a good charge, you're not going to be able to have a successful rotational grazing plan. <clears throat> so make sure that, <clears throat> that you have good voltage on your poly. Now there's a difference in poly wire. The poly wire, the, like I had said before, the electrons are flowing on the surface of the wire. So if you have um, um, the conductors of the wire, the more conductors that you have on the poly wire, the less resistance you're going to have to the electrons to flow down that wire. So I would recommend a nine wire or nine conductor poly wire versus a six conductor or three conductor. So that means you need nine conducting wires wrapped around the poly or wrapped within the poly wire or poly tape or whatever you're using. That uh, and those conductors are uh, are going to transfer the power. You need to make sure you have a poly wire that's going to have tensile strength enough to. Uh, to hold up to the strain uh, of uh, the reel, etc. So poly wire is real important, and the quality of poly wire is very important. And usually there's a difference between the six wire and the nine wire of about 100% in cost. Here's an example of a buffalo fence that we installed with poly rope. <clears throat> And uh, this is a 3 8 inch diameter electric rope and uh, very conductive, very um, um, has a low resistance in ohms per mile and uh, good, ha good tensile strength. When you look at a, a permanent poly product, you want to buy a product that is made for, uh, uh, for horses because uh, the horse products are meant to be permanently installed um, and not uh, the products that we use to roll them up, to roll up and put away or use to rotate. So if you're going to use poly as a permanent installation, you have to make sure that it is UV resistant and it's going to be able to withstand uh, um, 10 years or more. So here's an example of a geared reel. There's geared reels and there's standard reels. Um, a lot of farmers are going to prefer a geared reel uh, that you crank the reel, and every time you crank it around, it turns three revolutions. If you see in the background uh, in front of these beef cattle is what's called a tumble wheel. And uh, the tumble wheel is a product that you can be able to move your fence uh, by uh, one person standing and, and and just walking ahead, and one tumble wheel will tumble, and then the next one, and so on. And this is a picture of a pasture walk. So, mental barriers, adopt the fence construction to fit your terrain, uh, species-specific design. Uh, sheep needed and goats need a lot more jewels, a lot more wires. Uh, are we worried about predators? Uh, if we are, we need uh, to have some electricity maybe on the outside of the fence. Is your fence compatible with deer traffic? Um, I prefer what's called a flexible fence versus, versus a rigid fence, and so that when a deer would uh, jump through the fence, uh, the fence will bend and bounce back. Uh, fewer posts are, are better than too many. Uh, proper handling of poly products. Don't drag the wire through the through the grass. Walk as you reel the wire up. But don't drag the wire to you. And the cost of construction. Uh, we talked a little bit about voltage, amperage. Oh, a positive-negative system. 
A positive negative system is where you have uh, uh, one wire uh, electric and the other wire grounded. Not just dead, but grounded. So what you need to have is that negative wire needs to go back to your ground host so that when they touch both, the they need to touch both wires and uh, you'll be able to get a shock that way. You need to maintain the brush. You need to uh, control the uh, growth underneath it. So decide what kind of fence you need. Locate an aerial map. Send for an estimate. Contact a grazing specialist or a fence installer. Uh, research, there's grants available uh, 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 from the USDA for cost sharing for rotational grazing. Get your plan approved. Prepare the site. Schedule a fence installation. Call Diggers Hotline. Be available for the installer. And if you're hiring me, have some money ready when you start. Okay. That should be question time. Thanks so Are you much, with Randy. Me? Um, yes, we're with you. Um, so, folks, just a reminder that you will use the chat on the left sidebar. Um, so, just type your questions in there, and um, Randy and Larissa and I will be able to see them. Um, Randy, are you able to see the the questions? I see one so far yeah. coming in. Okay, so if you can just read them, you can answer them. Uh, and uh, you I guess, know, if you need help, okay, reading through. We can I got one here. Yes. How realistic is it to receive USDA help for a beginning farmer? Uh, beginning farmers have a really good deal because uh, if you are a beginning farmer and haven't started farming in the first 10 years, you get a lot more money than those of us who have been farming for 50. Uh, so you need to see the see your USDA or NRCS office, and uh, you need to be a rotational grazing. Um, you need to own livestock or have access to livestock from maybe somebody wants to rent your land and you'll be able to then get some cost sharing from the from the NRCS uh, for a beginning farmer. I've done uh, fences for people who have 3.9 acres and for people who have, uh, you know, thousands of acres. So. What kind of fencing for goats that have kids so that the kids can get out and all the fencing seems kids get out. Yeah, well, um, animals are controlled electrically. For an electric fence, animals are controlled at their chest height. And if you got a little boar goat that's two days old, its chest height is going to be about three or four inches. You need electric wire at three or four inches. One way to do that is what's uh, called Electronet. Um, Premier uh, company has uh, uh, extensive uh, um, choices for Electronet. And um, Gallagher has uh, what's called uh, Smart Fence 2, and that has uh, a line that can be quite low to the ground. Kids, uh, goats are really smart, and they have a really good time uh, outsmarting their shepherd. Uh, so uh, they're the trickiest animals there is to, to try to, uh, to keep in. The physical barriers, uh, there's a two, uh, 1348-2 or 1348-3 fence. That's 13 wires, 48 inches high and 2 inches between verticals. That works pretty well for goats as well as permanent. It's quite expensive. Is there a limit to how many head per acre? Uh, mob grazers will, they, when in rotation of grazing, uh, there's what's called mob grazing, and people will put uh, hundreds of thousands of pounds of animal per acre. Um, I've seen, I have a, a customer who will has like about 50 cows, and he will give them, uh, about 20 to 30 feet of uh, of grass along the long strip, and it's just like a feedlot. So he'll move that like real frequently during the day, 
and they'll just eat everything they come up up to and defecate behind them. It's kind of like a, a lawnmower in front and a manure spreader in back. And uh, the smaller uh, that you can contain them for a shorter period of time, the better it is for your soil, the better it is for your plants, uh, and the better it is for your, your animals. So uh, I guess there is a limit per acre. It uh, depends on what your forages are. That's your limiting factor, how much uh, feed there is in front of them. I heard a theory about having the lowest wire at high enough height that the animals will keep the line free of grounding weeds. Uh, I'm an advocate of uh, higher bottom wires. Uh, like I said before, your animals are controlled basically by the chest height. So whatever the chest height is, if you got cattle, um, dairy cattle or beef cattle, you don't need a bottom wire at 8 inches or even at 18. Get it up to 24 inches. Um, and then uh, it keeps the weeds away. Uh, if you have a low impedance fence charger, it's going to burn some of those weeds off. But if you get a really big, fat, leaf, fat uh, uh, weed, it's going to uh, take quite a bit of juice. What happens is uh, from early June to July, that's when we have a lot of load on our fence chargers. It's also the time here in Wisconsin where we have uh, um, good conductivity of the soil. So even if we have low voltage on our fence, uh, high amperage, we're still going to have pretty good contact with the ground. Um, so it's not as critical. What I like to do is wait until about the 4th of July and then trim underneath it. Would poultry electric netting work for goats and sheep? There is an electric netting for goats, an electric netting for sheep, Poultry electric netting will work for them, but it has more ohms resistance per mile. So I'd recommend uh, buying a, a sheep netting or, or a goat netting rather than using a poultry netting for sheep. But if you've got poultry and sheep, you'll have to use poultry netting. Um, look at netting as far as uh, its conductivity and its um, resistance in ohms per mile. Oh, okay. What is the ideal fence type for keeping a mix of animals together, sheep, goats, or cows, from Kristen? What is the ideal type of fence for keeping a mix of animals together? <laughs> well, okay, there's... Re what you have to do is fence for the most difficult animal. And in most cases, that's goats. Boar goats, is, or meat goats especially. Dairy goats are a lot easier to to get respect from than than uh, meat goats are, so you have to fence for the most uh, most difficult animal to to control. Um, also, if you're considering having uh, hogs, uh, and you need a a wire lower to the ground, and if you have uh, Shire horses, you need a wire uh, higher uh, higher up. Uh, uh, I always say that if you can, um, a fence should be 48 inches tall, and if your animal jumps over 48 inches, maybe that's an animal that you need to sell because it'll probably jump over 50 inches, etc. So there really is not an ideal fence for keeping a mix of animals in, um, but uh, like I say, you need to need to fence for the most difficult to control of any any species. Any other questions here or answers? Yes, this is uh, Larissa. We have a couple more minutes of people. Oh, I see another question came in for you, Randy. I don't have another one. Please mention, okay. Uh, the question: The question is, is there a limit of paddocks per acre? Paddocks per acre. Is there a limit of paddocks per acre? Um, uh, 
Uh, no. Uh, it, you know, it depends on, on your grass. If you're rotational grazing in the spring, it depends, on, I guess, where you're from and uh, your your pasture. Now, here in Wisconsin, we just got started grazing here. Uh, maybe some people have been grazing two weeks or three weeks. There's some people who haven't gotten their animals out at all yet. Uh, early, we want to have uh, big paddocks uh, because the grass is short and uh, move them fairly rapidly through through them. Start what's called the grazing wedge. Um, we want to uh, start to eat some grass off and then move them on so that uh, 21 to 30 or 45 days later, we can get back to that first paddock. Um, the paddocks, the number of paddocks is all dependent on, uh, on uh, how your grass is growing and uh, it varies. And you don't want to put up any permanent, if you can get avoid installing permanent paddocks, you're a lot better off if you can have uh, temporary wire and adjust the size of your paddock according to the according to the grass and the number of head and the type of animals you have grazing. So it's really not not any limit to them per acre. What is the most typical mistake you can see in fence construction? Thank you, Melissa, for that question. The most Typical mistake I see is too many posts, too many wires, and too many gates <clears throat> in electric fencing. <clears throat> uh, the fewer posts you have, the fewer wires you have, the less maintenance you have, lower cost, and easier it is for you to maintain that wire. People a lot of times think about putting a post every 12, 15 feet apart. And that's just a complete waste of money and of steel or whatever material you have. If you can get your electric fence posts 45, minimum of 45 feet apart, uh, other than if it's for cattle or, or horses, uh, you, you want to, you can even get them 60, 70, 80 feet apart. Uh, as long as you can keep that wires, those wires fairly tight. Uh, for sheep, you need to be at that 30 feet apart or or less. But try to stay 30 feet apart because uh, 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 you got a lot of flexibility in that. Remembering if you're using an electric fence, it's a mental barrier, so they're not going to be contacting that that fence only the first time. And uh, the fewer posts you have, the fewer insulators you need to replace, um, and I would recommend that your your fence is flexible rather than rigid. Uh, so w we had a, uh, we installed a fence here the other day for uh, some, um, uh, for the DNR that has some prairie chicken land, <clears throat> it's 80 acres of fence, and they rented it out to some Amish people. These are old order Amish, and they have old order Amish cattle. And the uh, first time these cattle had been out on pasture, and they didn't, didn't have any idea what electric fence was because they're old order Amish. Anyhow, the trucker backed up to the gate, opened the, opened the door, and let about 30 head of heifers and, and steers out. And they just put their tails up in the, in the air, and they ran as fast as they could across this 80 acres, halfway across the 80 acre field, turned around and came right back towards the trailer and went right through the fence out onto the county road. We were able to chase these cattle back in through the gate and back in the fence, back in. But the fence that we installed was a flexible fence. The, po the, the posts that we had are, were plastic composite posts. They bent, and the, the posts were spaced far enough apart that actually when the animals went through them, nothing broke. So the, the animals got back in. The fence was still testing about 5,000 volts. And everything was fine, and we now train those uh, older Amish cattle to electric fence. So further apart, flexibility. All right, where am I now? Uh, are there any additional books or resources that you can recommend? Uh, I would, I would say the best resources. This is from Laura Johnson. The best resources I would recommend are um, are fence company brochures and fence company catalogs. The three most important are Gallagher, Premier, and Kenko that I can see so far. 
PowerFlex also has a good uh, um, publication out. Uh, there may be some more uh, fence companies that are, uh, talk about uh, the wire companies, the uh, charger companies. They're all really good co publications, and they have a lot of educational information in them all. Read them first. Uh, is pasture all? If pasture already has a three rail horse fence, could you re retrofit it for sheep and goats or a cow? This is from Kristen. Yes, you can. You can use what's called an offset bracket, and uh, there's uh, offset brackets that will offset uh, the electric fence from the from the wood or whatever type of fence you have, I'd recommend an offset bracket that's at least six inches and preferably 12 inches long. Remember I said that you control the animal at the chest height. So if you've got sheep, you need that wire about 12 to 14 inches off the ground. For cattle, it should be about, about 32, 36. So Zachary says, uh, what kind of perimeter fence would you recommend for a hog operation where the neighbors have high-value crops? Um, when we do hog fences, I like to install a woven wire uh, like uh, 36 inches high uh, and has small gaps on the bottom. So uh, a 939 or 36-inch 10 wire uh, with six inches between verticals, I'd like to install that around the perimeter and then an offset bracket at about 10 inches to, to with electricity on the inside. And then you can maintain your uh, rotate uh, for hogs on the inside. But really for a good control, I would, I would put the woven wire on the outside. The thing about uh, uh, electric fence and hogs is if, if they're rooting hogs or if they're able to till that soil up, then you might have trouble with that, them shorting the fence out, although they have really good respect for electricity. We used to have hogs here, and uh, um, once uh, we put up an electric fence, we couldn't get them to go across it. Uh, we could, we took the fence down, but we couldn't get the hogs to move across it. We had to put a pail over their head and back them over. So um, uh, they do really respect electric fence. Uh, could you use barbed wire fence with a wooden wooden fence? Could you use barbed wire fence from Kristen? Um, I'm not exactly sure what she means. Could you use barbed wire with wooden fence post or uh, in combination of wood? Uh, I don't know. See the necess necessity to have uh, a wooden fence and a barbed wire, but uh, um, I guess you could do that for the rail. Wood, wood fence. I asked about. Oh, could you use a, a barbed wire in? I, I guess you could um, if you don't want to use electricity. But you'd basically be installing a whole new fence in, inside of the of the rail fencing. Um, you could install a, a a barbed wire between the planks. Um, that would be that would be all right. That would be practical. I would use a high tensile barbed wire. Um, I don't know how much more control that would give you. Uh, it depends on your species, I guess. Uh, if it's for goats, um, you need to have the uh, things pretty close together. If it's for Goats or sheep, like I said earlier, uh, an eight wire, you need eight wires, barbed wires for sheep control or for goat control. So you need like three inches or so between the wires on the, on the bottom anyhow. <clears throat> Yeah, does anyone else have, oh, we have another question come in. Do I offer more service than fencing advice? <laughs> Not really, I guess. I, um, I, I have consulted uh, internationally uh, for um, overseas cooperative assistance, uh, USAID, and I have consulted basically with uh, in the sheep industry. Uh, did some consulting in Russia and uh, and Macedonia, Kazakhstan, 
Armenia, Azerbaijan, uh, Mongolia, uh, mostly with sheep and goats, about uh, some about rotational grazing and some about breeding, etc. as far as that goes. Uh, um, if you're interested in, you know, uh, some of that uh, conversation, yeah, I could talk to you about that. Do you, uh, okay. Okay, new farmer in Westfield, yeah. As far as beginning beginning farmers go, I, I, I do advise people as far as fence locations uh, are, you know, I used to breed a lot of sheep and sell a lot of sheep. I ended up, ended up that a lot of uh, people who uh, who decide to get into sheep business decide to get out of the sheep business within the first ten years. Uh, so a lot of times I'll uh, consult sheep, consult people to get to to not raise sheep or not raise goats. Um, <clears throat> for new farmers looking for support, please consider joining. There you go. I think we answered everyone's questions. I think so too, unless any other questions roll in in the next minute or, or so. Um, well, Randy gave us his information, so if people do have um, a need to follow up with him, he does have a website and his email. Um, uh, and you'll be able to find them on the slides that we'll be sending out and sharing. Um, immediately following this webinar, but, oh, we have one more question. How long can you expect electric fencing to last if you roll it up for the winter? You're talking about portable electric fencing? Uh, I guess it depends on the quality, uh, but uh, you should be able to uh, get most of that poly wire or poly uh, uh, tape to last 10 years. Uh, I've been selling uh, poly wire for at least that long. And um, as long as it's cared for, not uh, uh, the sun is what breaks it down. So if you get it indoors over the winter, that, that makes a lot of difference. Um, rolling it up keeps it in the shade uh, and taking good care care of it when you when you pay it out or when you roll it in. I see most of the time a poly wire is destroyed from, from an accident or from somebody uh, being ruthless with it, um, not from just uh, if it has normal use. I, I never see any problems with, uh, with it lasting uh, la 10 years. So that should be good. Well, so on behalf of FACT, Lisa and I would like to thank you, Randy, so much for taking the time this evening to share our, you know, all this information with us um, about how to do fencing the right way. There's obviously a lot of variables to consider, and um, you went through a lot of um, really helpful things. Uh, we also know that this is an extremely busy time for, for you and for all the other farmers who are able to join the webinar. Um, uh, so just so you know, we'll be sending around the links to the audio and the visual parts of Randy's presentation. Very soon you'll be able to access the slides and the, the audio and visual recordings um, as well. We encourage people to take a moment to fill out a very brief survey. I know Lisa mentioned this earlier uh, that will immediately follow. Um, it might be a little late depending on what time zone you're in right now, but um, your feedback will really help us as we plan for future webinars. And I also would like to give a plug for our email list, our Fund a Farmer email list and our Humane uh, Farming Forum, which I know we just posted on the sidebar um, that will help you learn about all kinds of upcoming things like um, future webinars, scholarship and grant opportunities. Um, so folks know that we do offer um, uh, Fund a Farmer grants to farmers and um, uh, rota uh, fencing for rotational grazing for, for certain species of animals would um, is one of the projects that could potentially be covered. Just so you know, um, those grants will be 
uh, being announced. Uh, uh, actually, the application periods will be opening um, in September. So keep an eye out for those. And you can actually indicate if you want to sign up for the email list or the fun, uh, Humane Farming Forum during the survey. So thank you once again, Randy. And we're so glad that everyone could join us this evening. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.